Thanks very much, Doreen. Um, we, we have quite a lot of time, in fact. Um, so not only for questions, but also for really anything you want to say, comments, and anything on the Kilburn Manifesto or Thatcherism, <coughs> neoliberalism, anything else. If economic growth is bad, sorry, if economic growth, yeah, if economic growth is bad, is economic shrinkage good? Is it better if we, if our economy shrinks? Well, I think. Sorry, should we take a few? Yeah, yeah, let's take a few. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's. Um, that's Mine was just a very a simple comment. Really, I just find it quite ironic in the context of what um, has just been said about wealth not mm. uh, equaling happiness. That the government's gone very quiet on the well-being agenda and all the research they were doing until very recently. Um, I don't know where that's at. We've heard an awful lot about it when Cameron first came in. Um, but that showed very clearly, I believe, from the kind of results I gave. But it mirrored what you just said about yeah. wealth not equaling happiness. Yeah. And people here? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. So now, well, I think it's, in, it's very interesting that you mm. Take another Oh, All right, you are just just okay. training. Um, okay. Yeah. Just, James there. Oh, sorry. Just uh, just to point out that Japan managed to bring inequality down whilst it was shrinking in its last decade. So you know, it doesn't need growth to redistribute. Uh, it was one of the points I was going to. Yeah. That's exactly. Worth, that's worth remembering. You know? Mm -hmm. Well, no, if we link those two points up, exactly, and different models of an economy, not just models of growth, produce different levels of equality and inequality, absolutely. Um, so that would be part, part of an answer to you. Mm. Yeah, let's take another Just to comment on this, because I, I think that uh, linkage between uh, inequality and just the state of your economy is uh, an important one, but there's a, in Wilkinson Pickett's book, there's a chapter they don't, that isn't long enough <laughs> um, about why those countries that are less unequal are less unequal. They just throw out this comment that losing a war is one way of being uh, more equal for a period of time. And it's a real pity that that notion isn't drawn out rather more as to what circumstances. <laughs> are they the thinking about well, Germany and Japan? Uh, they, they, they elucidate a number of cases, and yeah. I just can't remember what they are, yeah. but it's a very striking thing in that book. And it's just a real pity not to explore the element of um, pain and loss, and everything that goes with that, um, but, but you get greater equality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe we should go to war over the Malvinas and lose. <laughs> 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 just uh, another question here, John. I was just well, in, uh, just not the other side to that. In but our, our period in which we managed to increase equality was post the Second World War, and, you know, despite the fact that we supposedly won it. So you know, it's not yeah. it's not just losing it to from that. But, but my the point I was wanting to raise was um, we were talking about globalisation, and it seems to me that one of the big uh, successes is the way of the neoliberal agenda has been that they've managed to export this economic model and the, it's been, become the norm, not everywhere, but in, you know, in a, a large proportion of the globe now. And, it, and in those circumstances, it becomes much harder for indiv individuals to comprehend how they can begin to challenge that. It's not just, I've got well, to persuade our government that they're wrong. So yep. it's yep. easier for it to become really common sense. Yeah, I think we've got enough probably <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, um, loads of stuff. I think on, I mean, I don't think there's automatic associations. Economy shrinks means you're happier. I mean, we've got one example here, and I'm sure there are examples the other way. The question I'm trying to ask is, what do we mean by an economy? And what do we want to get out of it? What is clear is that uh, high rates of something we call growth um, don't necessarily produce the kind of society I guess many people in this room would want. So it doesn't mean that the opposite is in, in, you know, automatically true. Um, on the well-being agenda, which relates to that again, um, it was you, wasn't it? Mm. Um, yeah, I remember 
Cameron saying at some sorry I'm going to stand up now it's a matter with the camera um, Cameron saying at some point there's more to life than GDP um, <laughs> he was in the big society phase of his government sure. and he was getting it was warm and cuddly stuff yeah lasted about two months <laughs> yes but what really annoyed me and there was a lot of debate about that at the time and I mean at one level it's true I mean again coming back to, to your question there is more to life than GDP, and in fact, most of our activities in life are not economic activities. They're not commercial activities. You know, just being here, uh, the conversations we'll have afterwards, what we do most of our days is not, and most of our social relations is not that kind of um, stuff. But what he wanted to do, I think, was to add some warm and cuddly bits onto the GDP so that we would measure happiness, so <coughs> we would measure, I don't know what, probably not equality. Whereas I think it's a big structural question about the way in which we relate to the economic more generally. There's a whole section in the vocabulary's instalments, if you want to read it, about the way in which we think about work as a kind of evil necessity, rather than, I mean, you know, your good old 19th century old time socialists used to think it could actually be something within which one could grow. That it was an important part of life and could be a fulfilling and creative experience. I mean, I, young people looking at me like I must be completely potty, but it, it, it is in principle possible uh, that work is not just a transaction where we go and suffer in order to get some uh, money to go out and be consumers. So it's a... I think that that point that Cameron made touched on something, which in a sense gives me hope that I do think there is a feeling of dissatisfaction and even a, a fairly widespread unease with the way society is at the moment. It's very unfocused, very inarticulate maybe. Um, so he touched on it, but just adding a few nice things in or say, go and volunteer with your local group and become part of a big society as if people weren't doing it anyway is not the way to do it. It's got to be more structural than that. Um, losing a war makes you more equal. Um, actually, I think it's politics. I, I mean, I don't think it's... I, I'm not saying that those big things don't provide conditions in which uh, different, different kind of potentials are fulfillable. Yeah? Obviously, that is the case. Um, but if you look at the countries that are becoming more equal at the moment, or at least where poverty is being most reduced, I mean, there's China on the one hand, but the example I would refer to is, is Latin America, where it's a political commitment to uh, spread the wealth more equally, whether that's wealth from soya or oil or whatever it is being spread more equally in, in the left-wing countries in Latin America than it has been for decades. And that's because you've got left-wing governments back, backed by and pushed by and in very, a whole variety of very complicated ways articulated with very strong social movements and grassroots movements. I don't think politicians can do anything on their own unless there's grassroots pressure that creates the space and the impetus for them to, to say something, they will not dare and they will feel the pressure for it. So it's got to be both of those things. But that's what I think, it, it is political commitment in the end, from us and from uh, political sphere. Um, you mentioned globalization and the export of, this is what I missed <coughs> out at the end. I think one of the, I, I spoke all the time about the UK. Um, but neoliberalism is a global system. And it's had catastrophic effects, not just the crisis of it, but its actual, apparently smooth, normal functioning. Um, catastrophic effects around the world on land distribution, on labor, on resources, inequality, and democracy. I mean, neoliberalism is utterly, um, in its production of inequality, uh, detrimental to democracy. Um, and I think one thing that 
those of us here who are <coughs> in somewhere or the, based in the UK um, need to recognise the absolutely crucial role that the finance sector in this country, backed by the government since that year in particular, um, played in the globalisation of neoliberalism. And in, you know, programmes of privatisation in countries around the world, battles over water, gas, all the things we know about in Latin America, in Africa. A lot of the, the kind of ideological force behind that internationalization of neoliberal ideology has come from this country. Not only this country, of course, the USA. I mean, it was the USA that was behind the, um, the first September the 11th when La Moneda was bombed in, uh, in Santiago in Chile, but it's also been us, and particularly the finance sector. Um, and it is still the case that the finance sector in this country is, is a very powerful force around the world. And in my other kind of guise as a, as a kind of, somebody who moves between the academy and politics, I've, I've argued, a, a jo I'm a geographer originally, and I've thought a lot about the politics of place, and a lot, about, a lot of our politics of place is about defending our places against globalisation and stuff like that. But I've worked a lot in London, as I said, like in the GLC, and there's no way in London you can defend your local place against globalisation. London is at the heart of it, it's the seat of it. Um, it is the local place, one of the local places from which neoliberal globalisation set out on its mission of uh, global penetration. And so I kind of developed this idea of taking responsibility for one's own place, tracing the effects of one's own place, whether that be Leeds or Manchester, my place, or London, or the country as a whole, tracing the effects that we have around the world and, and taking, taking um, responsibility for that. Um, I mean, just a little example, I've just been phoned by John Christensen, who is the chair of um, Tax Justice Campaign. And he said, could you link that notion of uh, politics of place beyond place to the tax arguments that are going on at the moment? So that we argue not just about the effects of <coughs> the tax in this country, which are huge, um, but also about it being part of the nefarious economic role that the UK plays within the wider global economy and the damage it does around the world to other countries and other peoples. And that's, I think, it is about us taking responsibility. In the end, in some ways or other, we both, we are complicit even though we might hate it, with the fact that our economy has become dominated by finance and armed exports and, and a few other things. And I think that is something that politically we ought to take, in some way take responsibility for. That should be you know, part of the centre of our <coughs> that we challenge that as part of being, it's a way of being locally based internationalists, if you like, uh, politics of place beyond place. I think that, I mean, Mostly covered, right. Okay, there's several more points. Okay. We have produced Damien Hurst in Leeds, for instance, which has been widely... <laughs> Congratulations. Don't you, uh, this, this is probably a comment on the question, but don't you think that the, the recent uh, debacle of the Court Bank oh. was a classic example of, of um, how uh, seemingly proud institution which many of us bank with. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. I'll just go this because I want to say it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, massively capitulated to neoliberalism in the, not necessarily the form that it's all about, but how it actually constructed the ideal of what its customers were supposed to aspire to in the cultural products that it had in terms of its magazines, its imagery, its 
Co-op, if anyone's been in the co-op lately, co-op radio, which is going to be here today. Oh, in the shops? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In its banality and its yeah. um, absolute abject. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so considering you said yes, I'll go on to the, 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 the second point. Well, really no, can, is, I, can I, before yeah. you do that, can I? Because other people might want to, is it capitulate? It's very interesting that I had the thought of it. I mean, I'm thinking now, this is not an answer, it's beginning of a conversation maybe. People know what's happened with the co op, right? It's right. Not anyone. Right, mm -hmm. an awful lot of stuff has hit the fan. The co op is in um, grave economic problems. Mostly, as I understand it, and I'm catching up here. As a, it, it's got a big black hole. In the <coughs> it's it's <coughs> one point five million, billion, trillion, a yeah. lot of money. Um, most of which has come about through its attempt to step onto the kind of big stage of banking through taking over Britannia Building Society. As I understand it, that was the crucial bad step. And I think it raised, I mean, I think a lot of us gulped when we heard it was going to do it. And I, I thought, oh, well, it would be good if we had a mutual on the high street that was able to compete with all the other big banks and all the rest of it. Um, I didn't know what to think when the takeover happened. But I'm not sure. I think what it is, is <coughs> it is a capitulation to neoliberalism, but it's in the sense that, I suppose, it wanted to be successful, and so it adopted the terms of success, in a sense, that are laid down by the regime we're currently living under, and, and it has come a cropper. Um, I, I'd like to add something onto this, because I think that's another way in which things get inside our heads. Um, I, I want to say, this is a com completely different subject, if you don't mind, just briefly. I would like to say, a counter to every politician in this country, as I know, uh, that I'm against social mobility. Right? For <laughs> somebody <laughs> over there, went, right, great. Because social mobility, I, I did it, and it personally has disastrous effects. I, I came from Council House to Oxford, and it can do your head in. Anyway, um, partly because social mobility <coughs> in itself assumes there's a ladder, and you've got to climb it. And it, isn't it wonderful if kids coming off council estates can go to Oxford? Well, A, it isn't wonderful for the kids. I can personally tell I learned a lot and I, I've benefited from it, but it's not un unambiguously wonderful at all. Um, and B, it does nothing to make the ladder more horizontal. The ladder remains. And what we should be about is equaling out the inequality. Other social mobility, actually. That is not the question. But what is also at issue is what you have to do to be socially mobile. I mean, people talk about meritocracy, but the criteria, this comes back to the co op then. The criteria by which one demonstrates merit in the society that we have are not the kind of characteristics I really like in people competitiveness, self interestedness, sharp elbows. Staying at work all day, though I did do, you know, I'm nine, though I did do, I was a workaholic. But, you know, so we need not only to stop that there being a ladder, but to change the criteria through which we are said to have succeeded. Now, that's massive, right? That's rethinking the world, but we might as well. Um, we've, got to, we've got to change this common sense. So, so the whole notion of a meritocracy then, which we, again, is just a term that we use all the time. It, although the person who most used it, Michael Young, thought it was a terrible idea, most people think to think it's a good idea. One of the ways of criticizing is precisely the terms of competition that are prevalent in the current society. Sorry for such a long response, but it's a really interesting point. Can you come up with your second one? <laughs> yeah. Um, the second point was, was uh, Nothing to do with the first two. It's, 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 That's right. Some small way. Um, I, I, uh, I think the big society was uh, actually um, a step outside. Almost, uh, I mean, it was. It, it, nothing's clear and clean, is it? But, but um, <coughs> an interesting departure by Cameron, personally, and, and in particular 
wind of, of weird Toryism. Um, to, to redefine Thatcherism, you know, like there yes. is such thing as It was the softening yeah. of the image, yeah, exactly. wasn't it? But it was, mm. a, it was a hegemonic, a minor, obviously, because it, 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 it died. You know, it, it, Nobody it, understood. It's nearly dead. Yeah. But uh, it was a minor hegemonic project yes. in, its, it, in its own way. And, and it was extremely successful in its own, on its own terms, even though the, the, the term itself has, has, has died and been discredited. Them. It managed to grab a whole chunk of the third sector, the social economy sector, and have the most surprising people buy into it and not say, hang on, aren't you just robbing all our, all our language and all our hard work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And actually collaborate with it even though it was paid, it was obviously a, such a dismal, uh, you know, a, a superficial plot, etc. Et I mean, I basically agree with that. I mean, I think part of it was back to, to your point about there was this feeling that there was an unease, that there wasn't, a, that life was pretty arid, is pretty arid, that there needed to be more. So there were, it, he was again touching that sore spot of economics ain't enough. But at the same time, it was a very canny way of uh, two things. One is reducing the tax burden. Um, because these things happen outside the formal economy, and, and therefore, you know, if, the lo if a local group will run the library, great, we can stop paying librarians. Um, so there was that side to it. There's also a kind of um, an, a localism of a form which could have been extraordinarily regressive, I think. Um, localism without the massive injection, and I, again, I could cite examples of the opposite kind of localism in Latin America, but localism is this buzzword in our political discourse, but without massive injection of funds. Localism in a, an unequal society increases the inequalities. Um, whether they be inequalities just of money or of social capital or of purely the confidence to go and speak out. The, the rich and the confident and the, the socially competent will win if you just localize without massive injections of resources, training, facilities, all kinds of things to even out the playing field on which that localism will operate. So, I mean, the potential of big society was also quite horrendous in that sense. Um, <coughs> so, yes, but it did, it did touch those nerves, yes. And what, of course, they, they, some of the third sector and some of those <coughs> NGOs then started doing was not only buy into that, but start talking the competitive language of neoliberalism, everyone just got outputs and all the rest of Okay, so we had several other points. Okay. Start with Max, and we've been waiting for longer. <coughs> Thank you for this excellent um, discussion, well, talk that you've given and discussion that you're provoking. To pick up the point about the export of, low, the export of neo neoliberalism everywhere, I think it's worth adding in the great good fortune that they had, which was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transition from the Soviet Union, not via probably Gorbachev's idea of a more social democratic kind of, I, I suspect Gorbachev yes. would have gone for a more social democratic yes. kind of model in the former Soviet Union, but the absolute total collapse into what gangster capitalism, yeah. brackets neo, neoliberalism. Yes. So that was a massive piece of good fortune for yeah. the neoliberal project, combined therefore with the move in India to, to, to that model as well, the, the, the decline of um, proto-socialism of, yes. of, uh, of, of the post-colonial era, of, of, yeah, of the previous era. regime, yeah. and that capitulation to neoliberalism. So I think they had two great good bits of good fortune for, for them. But to move to the, um, and I'd actually, if you had a hour or so, I'd quite like to know what you think about China and what, what model, what model uh, China is now adopting, whether it's a kind of neoliberalism with an authoritarian state or whether it's a different model altogether. But anyway, um, you might not have time for that. The thing, the, the, thing, the thing that I agree completely with, you know, your, your the soundings project is this challenge to the kind of dominant common sense. And clearly it does require the work of great 
intellectuals like yourselves and your collaborators. But it sets, it, it absolutely crucially de depends upon either a coherent social movement or a new left social, yeah. social democratic party or, or, or left social democratic party. And um, I just wondered whether you think there's any prospect of that without, the, without, without uh, proportional representation in this country. Oh. Should we, we take a few more? <laughs> <laughs> just okay. on that. Yeah. Just on that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm going to order of waiting. So, uh, so at the back. So. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, let's make a point briefly before starting. If social mobility can go down as well as our. Well, exactly. Uh, I went from public school to uh, being a disabled benefit claim. And I bet it was just as uncomfortable for you as it was for me. Brilliant. But anyway, um, what I was thinking was um, <coughs> that something that I'm very concerned about within the neoliberal, in particular, financialised agenda of everything, is the issue of abstraction. And that is both spatial as well as, as kind of um, material as, as what's going on. Um, the, the kind of what the function of the stock market has become is a way um. to kind of pretend to be generating wealth through, you know, as, as, as you were yeah. me mentioning here, to, to be, what was it again, yeah, value extraction yes. from actual productive capacity yeah. in manufacturing, okay. mining, services, service provision, yeah. <coughs> but it's also a spatial abstraction because that so that value extraction is happening in the city of London, where, for example, manufacturing will be happening in China and mining will be happening, you know, in the Congo or something like that. Yeah. Um, and what do, you, what do you think about that? Why is that a spatial abs abstraction? So, with, so, so for example, yeah. what you've got, say, in, in somewhere like the Congo is a mining operation which in which you know you're, I guess, sort of generating wealth by digging, say, copper out of the ground. <coughs> but the profits of that are being oh, yeah. essentially mm -hmm. yeah, made yeah. in London so, uh, by yeah. natural market. Yes, and that has, for long, been the case. So, sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to wait on it. Yes. But, yeah. Let's think a few more. Yes. Yeah. No, it's organisations. I, I work um, with refugees, asylum seekers, and um, also comment on uh, racist discourses in, in the media. And I, I think there's no more kind of obvious kind of area for you know the kind of changes in language, yeah. particular Absolutely. kind of like immigration. Mm. If you just say mm. that, it conjures up a whole yeah. set of yeah. kind of things. And it's interesting that um, uh, Farage in his tour of the country actually called it the common sense mm. tour, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Which seems to me it's kind of... But what I'm interested also is you mentioned social movements, mobilisation. And I think that kind of um, discursive framing of racism, etc., has meant actually in very, very kind of sharp terms the mobilisation of the far right. Yeah? I think, Say that what's meant the mobilisation? Well, the, the way the way that the debate is framed, yeah. the, the, the the actual discourse around yes. Yes. Uh, immigration, <coughs> around mm -hmm. the image of the asylum seeker, yes. or whatever, yes. encouraged by politicians, uh, articulated by the media, yep. yeah, the language changes, the meanings yep. change, etc. But then the other bit of Gramsci and kind of theory, the actual mobilisation, you know, what happens? All right, the cat was can't enter money. Fear, but there's also struggle yep. that actually uh, changes hegemonic exactly. power, etc. And I, it just seems to me that, ironically, in Britain at present, the major mobilisation, in a sense, you can see related to that, is of the far right. Of, of, yep. and, and of course, that's actually mirrored in the major political parties and their kind of understanding of the language of the discourses, the racism. Mm. And finally, just a small no, point. A I mean, how would you how would you connect? You know, the, the battle, I mean, I, I admire the kind of analysis and the, and the kind of need for this, but how do you actually, perhaps coming back to points of being made by Max, how do you tie that in with mobilisation? You know, what kinds of mobilisation mm -hmm. are likely to contest that effectively? Is there anything around at present? What, what kind of, I think that's going to be the crucial issue. Okay. 
rather than a critique. Thanks. It's the kind of... Oh, hang uh, on, I, I wouldn't say rather than. Yeah. Well, well, okay, uh, you remember well, this question. in your grants in terms you're right, yeah. aren't you? I mean, the, the, the two go together, but, yeah, but yeah, I just yeah. want to, okay. you know, kind of Let, let's, bring that Let's make the question a little bit briefer, because there are lots of people who want to, want to speak. So, um, Sorry. Okay. Um, I mean, during our three, I mean, I mean uh, you started off with the, the notion of a conjunction at this time that mm. we're in, at mm. the moment, and I mean, that speaks to me very much. This kind of complete failure of the economic system at, at this time, actually, even in its own terms, mm -hmm. to, to do what it claims it's going to do. I mean, the collapse of the banks, etc., 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 all of those kind of things. Um, and yet, this, the, all of the solutions that are offered are all of the same. Yeah. There's nothing that can just be at all. The solutions in the are form. always yes. in the same kind of... And I, I'm, I'm utterly struck by the kind of discourse and, and my... I've got a radio that I can still listen to sometimes amazes me. Yes, that you have to run it across the room. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I, I kind of remember Blair in particular and his stuff on globalisation. Oh, the, yeah. it's, there is no alternative. It no. came out no. over and over and over again. And I absolutely agree with you that the, this need to, to rethink the economics. I mean, not being an economist in <laughs> kind of political theories, I'm always intimidated when people stop talking about the economics. And I do think, I mean, and yet it seems to me at the same time, without a, a, an ability to attack this incredibly entrenched economic vocabulary, we can't progress. <coughs> and I do think you're right by saying we need to actually widen what we mean by the economics. Exactly. Embed it in a society. Absolutely crucial to widen it about social relationships and equality rather than what we want out yeah. of life. But uh, I was struck when, because about three or four weeks ago, um, a month ago maybe, I went to Beyond the Frankfurt. Oh yeah, I think two of us were there. In London. Yeah. And um, I remember 1979 being a conjunction for me. It was a crucial conjunction at the time, being, I mean, being involved in kind of IS and the left and blah, 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 and then in feminism. And 1979 being a kind of, a, when Thatcher was elected, being a, a real kind of con conjuncture. Yeah. Out of that came, I mean, I joined the Labour Party. I joined it in 64, 65, and then left. Uh, and I like lots of other people, and I joined the Labour Party and threw myself into a whole range of, of, of things within the Labour Party, particularly to do with women. Yeah. Um, and what I was conscious of then was this need about alliances, and people come, keep coming back to this notion of, of, um, of the need for social movements, but also for alliances, because there are an awful lot of social movements but they all seem to be kind of fragmented in the same way as perhaps mm -hmm. we Very thought about them being fragmented in 1979. Mm -hmm. And what disappointed me about the Beyond the Fragments thing is we didn't really talk about that at the, at the last meeting. Well, no. um, and I found it really Fragment. disappointing from that point because what I, I was thinking of was it, it is about the, the political bringing together Let's, sorry, do you mind if we take some more? Yeah, questions? sorry. No, I, some, we have got it's a bit it's here. Yeah. Can you manage a few more <laughs> comments? No, 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 let me, because okay, it's okay. going to get out of hand. Yeah, um, we're not going to be able to respond to. I mean, we're all right, Paul. Um, I mean, there's a whole load of stuff here about. Um, <coughs> about what is to be done, uh, three of you at least. Um, and first of all, I, don't, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't say, don't do critique, do this. I don't think they're alternatives, I do think. And I do think the first way to, to fracture common sense, to, to, to move forward is probably to fracture the common sense. It's one of the crucial things we have to do. Um, so I, th I don't think they are, they're alternatives, I think. We need both. Um, and what we are doing is we're, cheers, what we're doing, I and mean, we are three kind of aging intellectuals, right? That is, we can't, we are, I think what one has to do is to think, who, who are you? What skills have you got? What can you best do? And what we've done is what we thought we were best able to do at this moment. I can't go out and start a social movement. Um, and I don't think that's a kind of fair demand. Um, so we've put in our tuppence. 
where we think we have the skills best to contribute. Um, what I, I agree about the fragments meeting. What was good about the fragments meeting, though, and what was terrific when we launched the manifesto was that the audience was huge. Um, and I do think, I mean, and they were both in London, uh, but the people indeed came from outside London, right? um, much to say as well. Um, and I'm going, going around doing other meetings, and, and I know there's endless meetings on the left at the moment. I do think that it is a moment when something could, there's, there's a kind of stirring going on. And I do think that it, I don't know how we do it, but I do think it's a moment when things could be done. So I think what one has to do is join in the movements one's part of and do use the skills that one has in, in the best way possible. I mean, what amazed me about the launch, and I say this partly because of the joke I made earlier about us being also ancient, was that 90% of the people were about third my age. No. And that was fantastic. So we, you know, in UK, Uncut, Occupy, all, I mean, I, I was quite involved in Occupy, but, but uh, you know, a whole range of people was there. Um, and I didn't, it's fragments in the sense that we're doing different things, UK Uncut, Tax Justice. But on the other hand, there's a kind of impetus which has a lot in common. So I don't feel quite so, I don't think it's as fragmented as it was in the days of, 1979 was not only the, day, the year when Thatcher, our nemesis, came to power, but also the, the, the year in which a book called Beyond the Fragments was published, which was about the relationship between the feminist movement and mainly the, the Trotskyist uh, left. We don't have, I mean, that hardly exists now. We don't have that kind of chasm <coughs> of incompatibility amongst all the movements that we had at that point, I don't think. I mean, I, I was never in one of them. Um, um, just, you also said abstraction, and it reminded me, there's a very, very good research group, political research group of economists called Corner House. And they, I mean, they're tough, they're a tough read. Uh, but they produce very good analyses of things like um, carbon futures or the market in food futures. I mean, when food <coughs> comes uh, out of the reach of the poor in the global south because they've been told to produce exports, and meanwhile people are making fortunes trading in grain on various stock markets, that's an abstraction from the reality of the grain. These are futures that exist only as a, as a, the only product is the making of a derivative out of them in the future. And they, people um, really write extremely well um, about that stuff if you're interested in cor Corner House. Um, I really, if, you, if you're up for a bit of economics, I, I, good economics, really good economics, then I recommend you follow them up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please. I think there's a few more questions. Let's start from again, the order in which they were. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you could. Okay. Um, I was just going to um, add to Max's statement that, mm -hmm. that as you said, there's very little political disruption of the consensus. It's partly what you've been talking about. There's a general <coughs> election in two years' time. Yes, there and, is. Um, in fact, when, when Danny Dornan addressed the Taking Soundings meeting um, you know, a, few, a few months ago, and the same question was asked of him what is to be done? He said, look, the Labour Party is an empty shell, dot, dot, dot. I mean, like Sarah, for pragmatic reasons, I mean, I'm also a breach of my Labour Party. But, uh, you know, that, that, that space is, is there to be filled. I think I, so. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I wonder what you thought about you know, how, how much can be, can be pushed. But you, you, you have part of the answer. I think so. And I mean, you know, keep on doing it, but expect to be disappointed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. You you want to ask a question here? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. I thought you, you started by saying that we've got a right wing media, which which well, a mixture uh, yeah. blankets everything and stops us from even yeah. if we can dare to do this. Yeah. I don't think it's all right wing, I, but I think that which isn't militantly right wing is very com kind of just acquiesced. It's given in. Yes. Yes. It's stopped yeah. being challenging. Yes, 
I just wondered what you wrote, what you felt was the role of modern technology. I mean, with you, your group of three, with you the youngest, I just wonder if modern technology has got something to offer, or whether you should have a soccer room. I have to confess it's not my forte. I don't actually have a computer at home. Um, and I, but, um, I mean, I cannot, I cannot, I mean, clearly it's very, very important. I will say, I was totally amazed. This is, laugh, please don't. We did this, we did this piece, for, I did this piece, for Calories of the Economy, right? The Guardian produced a small version of it, put it on comments, it's free. And by, I think it was midday the next day or something, to, you have to tell me is this good or not. Because mm. uh, I don't know. 2,560 something good. people have put it on Facebook. Oh. Is that good? Yes. 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 Right. <laughs> but, but you probably need to be doing more of that. More of that. Yes, I, have to, I, don't, I haven't you, stopped but, but working <laughs> on this stuff. But, but no, of course, it, 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 is, it is massive. I mean, I think the trouble is an awful lot of the stuff I read, like blogs and things, is just complete rubbish, yeah. actually. And a lot of it is, is um, uh, just, yeah, just not worth reading. A lot of it is just foul as well. So there's a way, it's a, there's a way in which one has to distinguish um, and you sure. know, know what you're looking for. But in terms of means of communication and potential areas for uh, debate, massively so, I'm also a member of the um, New Political Economy Group talking about economists, which is all radical economists, and, and that's <coughs> very active and very very much run through um, and the new media. So I don't think I go as far as people like Paul Mason. I don't think it's an untrammeled force for good which is going to, which in itself is the basis of new movements. But, but I do think it's phenomenally important. It, it is a tool which yeah. needs to be used. Yeah, absolutely. And um, massively important. Bec it's also international. I mean, the day after we launched the manifesto, I had to go to Zurich, and I got off the plane, and they already knew about the Kilburn manifesto. I mean, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have happened in the past. So, I'm impressed. Yeah. But it is massively uh, used by the global uh, corporations yeah. as well, of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to raise this point. I mean, we're going to talk about Paul Mason and Manuel Casals, who talk about the networked individualism. Yeah. You know, that everybody are now consumers in a sense, and they also consume and they're interested in various positive <coughs> protests. And also back to your your origins as a geographer and the position of place. You know, how many of us since 2009 have protesters. Uh, uh, protesters have, have, have found their form in taking squares, public squares. Yes. You know, like Taxim Square yeah, now in yeah, yeah. you know, Brazil today. You know, that's the stuff kicking off there as well. So I think, again, thinking about sort of 1970s, 80s, and how much public protest there was in terms of street protests, between the nights, trade union marches, how that all went <coughs> in the 80s, 90s, and again, how points of protest are finding their form in public space and squares. I think that's really interesting and important. But how people are, how ideas are, are moving globally very quickly through network technologies. And when people are coming together, not in terms of a, a, a common cause, but many different causes. Yes, that's, that's exactly it, yeah. And I think, I think that's also very interesting. Yeah. Finding form not in just in terms of one authority, but in many authorities, and it's the dialogue in public space that I think is really the phenomenon now that is challenging a lot of politics. Uh, and maybe, in fact, it's this whole thing about well-being, maybe we need to reintroduce protest into notions of well-being. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, well, you know what I mean? Because that's yeah. when you feel really alive again, when actually you're engaged. Istanbul is it's, it's, it's a very good example. It's a mixture of people, some of whom don't use social media at all. It's, yeah. it's a mixture of elderly people meeting young people and actually. Not all elderly people are completely illiterate. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, it's only me. No, no. Uh, but it's a question of. Like, uh, you know, Istanbul yeah. and stuff like it's, it's like there's many people, there's like graduates without jobs. Is one of the Paul Mason thing is like, you know, they were forced. But also there were trade unionists, there were people who were sort of out to the job market altogether. 
And actually, there was a common characteristic of people protesting. There's many different, and again, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, can I, yeah. I'd, I'd ask two questions of that. I don't expect to answer them, but because they're just things I don't know. Is why is it important that they're square? Yeah. I mean, people say, everybody says it, and they say, you know, that's really important, isn't it? It's geography, because it's a place. And I'm, I'm just not, you know, I'm not sure. And the other thing I'd say is they're all squares in major metropolitan, cosmopolitan cities. And the vast proportion of many of those countries are peasants uh, living outside those places. And we should immediately assume that those liberal voices represent a majority. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, you know, thinking of Seattle and all the other things we've probably all been involved in, what's the longevity of the alliance that is created there? Yeah. What, and I, I'm not sh I think it's fantastic that it happens. I mean, all that stuff about the turtles and the trades unionists in, in Seattle and all the rest of it. Um, <coughs> but real alliances are very hard work. And they involve negotiating over demands that may actually be quite contradictory to each other. Um, so it's what happens after that, what is done with that? And that's where the fleetingness of new technology can be a brilliant intro, but doesn't necessarily consolidate. Now, but it's, it's, I suppose it's a set of skills and aspirations and confidence to regroup. And that's what I suppose people of our generation, we But you know, it really, sense. it really, Everybody on the left, including our, our own government, so that's another thing we can think about, got really excited about the Arab Spring. Nobody knew who, who it was, hardly. Um, they weren't elected, they were rebels. And we sent in bombers, as I remember, or we, we sent in military of some sort, I can't remember, and money and all the rest of it. Uh, and the left loved them. And yet in Latin America, We have elected left-wing governments, massive social movements, far to the left of anything that there was in the Arab Spring, far more radical. And it gets no publicity at all. Hardly anybody is talking about it. And the right-wing press, quite understandably, and right-wing governments absolutely hate it. I mean, the vilification of Chavez, of Morales, of uh, Cristina Kirchner is incredible, the misrepresentation. I just think it's very, very interesting why the, why the Arab Spring and the young people in squares, I'm not against it, but why all the excitement when there's such <coughs> other stuff going on? Really building new societies. And you get either vilification and misrepresentation or a lack of speaking about it at all. But anyway. Yeah. Okay, let's just... Keep your questions again brief. We're almost running out of time. Okay. That's, that's Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the city of London. Uh, capital C. Yeah, yeah. Capital C, yes, the financial yeah. district, yeah. square one. Yeah. Has of course been powerful for a thousand years, yep. as you know. Um, for at least the last century, all its policies have been designed to redistribute income from the rest of Britain to itself. Absolutely, yes. it comes back to okay. your point. Yes. Self regulation, as you know, existed well up until. Yep. Um, the end of the 20th century and uh, the regulation that exists now is, is totally ineffective, as, yes. as you all know. Yes. Um, I think the empowerment, Thatcher's empowerment of the city at the time of the Big Bang was possibly her most costly legacy. And well, what for, her, for her, her, her biggest triumph, maybe. <laughs> possibly, quite possibly. Um, but what it's done is to, of course, increase Uh, inequality by the redistribution of income yeah. from wages and, and salaries to yes. profits and interest. And this is also, you mentioned the quality of work and the fact that work used to be regarded as a good thing. But I think that work has become more, less and less tolerable for many people everywhere mm -hmm. as more and more pressure is imposed by management mm -hmm. and people are, um, have to work under much greater pressure. And this, of course, is not pleasant. Uh, so the whole work experience, I think, is deteriorating mm. uh, for many people uh, everywhere. Mm. And not just in Britain, of course, it goes, it's a global thing. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's, okay. that is that's so. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Oh.
Right. On election day. Okay, first, uh, if we do nothing, do you expect things to get better? Okay. Next one was... You can't do nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Uh, next one was... I mean, doing nothing is doing something. It's acquiescing. Yeah, kind of. Just like if we, if we, as the group of people who need to do something to make things better, didn't do anything, would things get better anyway? It's like the clip or something. Anyway, forget that. Yeah, Next I think one. I'll... Okay. Uh, I, I was thinking like the hits that things get, like your article or like uh, a video on YouTube. They're Is there a video? Of, yeah, sorry, like a YouTube yeah. video. They get yes. a lot of hits or your article gets some hits. The amount is important. Yeah. It is. In the same way, I think it's kind of a metaphor maybe or what the right word is, for uh, groups of people meeting in the square. Ah, good. The virtual square type. Yeah, in the same yes. way, no one's yes. really... No one's yes. got any commitment to that, but it's in, like the size video becomes important because I'm getting answer. Becomes important because a lot of people have seen it, and then the media take off because a lot of people they go out, people think this is interesting. But there's no commitment, and it's kind of uh, like you're saying, unless there's a movement afterwards, just being in the square and people go, no, people like this. Doesn't really have any effect long term. It's kind of superficial. And the last part. So what do we do about that? Oh, well, you know, you need to make, like you're saying, use your own skills, kind of, and get back here. And I think if people meet in the future, they might make friendship groups and things in new circumstances and be able to communicate through Facebook and things with each other yeah. and show that they still think those things. Like, I still think have this idea constantly on this screen. And the last one was I wanted to ask if you expect Labour to win. Win <laughs> <laughs> what? The election? Yeah. yeah. Does it matter? Um, Good. No idea. Because I think earlier on you said that you, you and your friends sort of predicted that Labour would win, and you. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 Hmm? No, no. It's, sorry, not the exact time. Oh, oh yeah, right. wait, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had this idea of what they need to do, but they didn't do, didn't deliver. Well, but I think we strongly have the similar ideas now. Exactly, exactly. I, I think we strongly suspected they wouldn't do what we wanted them to do. So we set up soundings a couple of years in advance to try and say, I suppose one always thinks this is a moment of historical opportunity, but we did. I mean, for those of you old enough to remember, the Tory party was in complete yeah. ruin. It was yeah. utterly full of corruption. And there was um, a genuine feeling, I think, about environmental issues and about international issues. And the kind of shame of the way the Tory party was at that point. But you felt, this is a moment when somebody could say really radical things and get away with it. And they didn't. The first thing they did was to commit to expenditure, and then we got blah, 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 blah. And, and then what we felt was that historical opportunity had been missed. And I guess, I guess, what, insofar as we're thinking about party politics at all, what we, we're, again, two years before the election, what we're thinking is, can we contribute to having a debate that goes wider than the current political debate that would open more space to enable Labour, those within Labour who are more radical, to be able to do something? But without that, that wider uh, base, it, it wouldn't happen. But I don't think our prime focus is electoral. I think in terms of you know, a, a more general Gramsci analysis, this is about, and it relates to the thing about the, the social media, it's about just trying to filter out a conversation. I mean, if, if everybody here went away and talked to 10 people, you know, it's a start. I mean, what else can you do at one level? Just, just keep asking all good questions. Just keep rephrasing things in different ways. Just keep challenging the common sense that, because very, very good people, um, you know, quite without thinking we buy into this common sense. You don't have to be on the opposite side to, a fact, to find that your Im imagination has been uh, invaded by all this stuff. I mean, I find it all the time. So, everybody talk to people, I think. Okay. Uh, can you take just a few final round of questions? Yeah, just yeah. Sort of briefly, Quick, yeah. Uh, coming, coming back to the issue of Occupy and noting that uh -huh. A couple of other people who were involved in Occupy and Leeds said. Um, yeah. I think, I mean, certainly our thinking at the time was that we were becoming very fragmented and that Occupy was a good way to bring together things like UK and Cubs. Ah, right. And good. the other pressures we were facing. 
And I've been involved in a few conversations in the last few weeks where people have just said, hang on, were we not two years too early? <laughs> people are thinking, you know, mm. we're all off discussing the bedroom tax, disability and welfare reform, UK and car are obviously still there, etc, etc. We seem to have dissipated back into groups. And there's a particular focus that Occupy was very interesting for. And the focus on a spatial location, I think, was also part of that. It was trying to bring together things in a central point where we could have both discussions about what what it was we wanted and how we felt we could get out of the situation we were in. But it seemed to have dissipated before it could become something that could take action, in, in my view. I don't know what, what mm. your thoughts are being mm. involved in it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's a if you want it. Yes? Well, no, sorry, please ask behind. You haven't asked yeah. before, have you? Ah, okay. um, well, yeah. it's just, a, it's just a quick question on hegemony. I mean, you characterise the current, current era as the hegemony of neoliberalism. But well, isn't it more in this country? Well, isn't it more correct to see it as a, as a sort of really a crisis politics, the collapse of mainstream politics, there's an incredible disillusion with politics. So it's not that there's any hege hegemonic support for the status quo. It's more like there's no sense there's any alternative. What's the point of voting? And to what extent are you actually letting the left off the hook? Because there's not much analysis or reflection in your in the manifesto of why the left has failed. You know, the, the, the left has essentially accepted the market mechanism as the necessary mechanism to, to generate wealth. You mean the social democrats? The left. What, what, is, what is the alternative to the market? Right, okay. That's fine. Um, so you, you, you want to ask a question? Oh, this is, well, this is um, a bit of a bee at the end. But yeah. <laughs> do you have any, I mean, you're a geographer by background, you clearly have a lot of interest in the climate change debate. Um, I do too, just as a very kind of amateur watcher of such thing, I've been very struck by how the climate change debate kind of disappeared off the agenda. It's, it's slightly being revived again now, but do, do you have any sense that maybe at the end of the day the only thing is actually going to give us a tipping point for an acceptance that, um, you know, incessant growth is just not viable? Do you sense that climate change may actually provide that tipping point? One more question, yes? Um, so my question was thinking back to the the manifesto project, which I really like and love listening to your talk at the beginning. I was thinking about the way neoliberalism is very good at using the language of the left and how then do you use language to radically shift the debate. Yeah. So when you were talking about investment, I was thinking about new labour and the social investment state and children and family policy, but how that was very much caught up in ideas around responsible citizenship, future citizen workers and the rest of it. And now if you look at the way that things like empowerment, participation, resilience are deployed yes. um, in Cameron's big society. Um, now you respect the young people and that stuff comes out a lot. So so yeah, just a question about language usually really, and, and how much we can how much maneuvering space we have outside of that term. Thank you. That should be the final round of uh, responses. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I think resilience is a real weasel word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not working in. I, I take it you're working in that field, are you? but but I mean, I'm not, and and, and I don't know how much room for manoeuvre there is. I know within the university sector, people, some people try and challenge the <coughs> terms on which we're supposed to operate, but I, and I think that has to be done. Um, I think in the social services it's a lot more difficult, it's a lot more audited and controlled, um, but it's still, it, it is still very important and that language is absolutely forming of the way in which those services operate and the way in which both the clients and the providers of the services uh, see themselves, so I think it, I mean it would be, it would be very interesting, I don't know if you can kind of think yourself about that kind of terminology and what, what kind of effects it does have. It would be very interesting. You would like to write about that? <laughs> <laughs> Try and write, but I will keep in touch. Uh, yeah. When I've got something substantial, I'll send it. No, seriously. Seriously. Thank you. Um, I don't believe the market mechanism is the only... I don't, I don't know quite what you were getting at at the end, but... Um, I don't think, I'm not simply anti-market, I do think, I mean I go to you know, local markets, I'm not, I don't, I'm not against the market mechanism, like in 
Cuba, I have sympathy at the moment for what they've done. I, th I, I regret it deeply, but I can understand some ways in which they've had to introduce certain kinds of market mechanisms. Um, what I think is markets are one form of social relation that helps us reproduce society, but so are mutual relations, so are state relations, so are local co-ops, so are completely non-commercial relations. And we need to have think of the economy in that old way of oikos, you know, the way all of those relations together enables us to live together and to move on through time. Your point about depoliticization is really interesting. I'm glad you raised it. I disagree, but I, I'm glad you raised it. Because I think um, they are utterly delighted we're depoliticized. It is wonderful that the big enemy is the politicians and not the bankers. Um, I think the, was it the Telegraph who did the thing about the MPs' expenses? I mean, it, it was a scandal, but it was also a very precisely targeted attack. I mean, I think the kind of rubbishing of the political realm and of politics is part of the construction of this hegemony and part of the depoliticization and attack on democracy in a way. Not that I have great faith in current forms of representative democracy, but this is part of the reasons why it is so derelict. Um, I'm going to miss a few things. On climate change, um, I don't know whether that's going to be the tipping point, and the problem is um, the people that are going to get tipped are poor people in the global south. Well, well, you know, I mean, one hesitates to say one is actually glad when a US city gets clobbered by climate change, but um, it's better than it happening in a poor area in the global south. Maybe it will make people wake up. Um, but there's a, a statement by, I think, I think it's Frederick Jameson saying, it is amazing that it is easier now to imagine the end of the world because of climate change and environmental catastrophe than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I think in popular imagination, that's true. Capital, this is the common sense thing. It, capitalism has become so much the way things are that we're more likely to be able to imagine environmental catastrophe than organizing life in a way that isn't capitalist. Um, Occupy. And then this relates to your question, uh, the question at the back of that, yeah. All of, all of it is, um, I, I absolutely, I mean, I'm not, there's no way in which I'm being negative about Occupy or about the things in squares. Uh, at all, um, and in fact, Occupy was, I mean, I've said this loads of times, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but Occupy was so tiny, even in London, and yet it was seen as such a threat, actually, just because it's asked such awkward questions. And there it was, those little inconspicuous, unassuming, unpretentious little tents between the vast stone edifices of church, of God and man, really, in London Stock Exchange and St Paul's. And it was an affront to the smooth space of neoliberalism, in a way. And I felt the outrage it provoked from the press and from the government, was, and, and indeed from some of the higher echelon of the church and so forth, was astonishing. And I think, it, although it may not have carried on, <coughs> and although you know some of the achievements are nebulous, one of the things it did do was to put, at least for a little while, some very fundamental questions on the political agenda. Um, it even suggested there might be an alternative, which is the most rude thing you can do. <laughs> <laughs> and then this thing about space, because there's so many different sorts of collective and public space, and occupies a good story about it, because the one in London, it was shifted from being outside the stock exchange to being at the steps of St Paul's, because it was discovered, nobody knew, that the space outside the London stock exchange was actually private. You wouldn't know, but they fenced it off in the end, and you couldn't go in. I tried to go in um, to go to the loo, and they wouldn't let me in. Anyway, 
Um, so they moved Occupy to the steps of St. Paul's, which of course symbolically became even more interesting um, over, the, over the time. Because that was a public space, but only a public space in the sense that it wasn't private. Only a public space in the sense that people could walk through it at lunchtime or on the way to the shops or on the way to work. And I, although a lot of the critique of neoliberalism in the city is about the privatization of public space, I think, yeah, that's bad. But really public space is more than that. And this comes back to a number of the questions. Really public space, and I think Occupy created one, and I don't know whether it's happening in Gezi or in Istanbul, or in, is a space where people do argue and take things further and have debate. A really good public space is one where the public is constructed. And one of the things I loved about Occupy was just being there, people talking all the time, and not just people who were sympathetic. People had come up and just talked to you about what, what's going on here, but don't you think, and why? Oh, I never thought about it like that before, and all that kind of stuff. And it, I mean, what we need as, as public spaces is more places for the construction of democratic engagement. <coughs> public engagement in that kind of sense, debate. And Occupy did that. The coming together in the squares allows the possibility of that. In some places it probably happens, and in, in others it's just a, a spatial coming together. But I think looking at these different forms of political spatiality or sub-political spatiality is really, really interesting and really important. And it's added to by their embeddedness in um, new technologies of various sorts, because Occupy was going around all, all around the world at the same time as we were all, or they were all huddled in the, in the tents at the bottom of the steps of St. Paul's. So I think that was everything. So thank you very much. Thank you.